thank you all for coming to the Johnson County Human Trafficking Coalition Power Hour series for August. As the title suggests, we'll be focusing on labor trafficking tonight. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the Johnson County Human Trafficking Coalition and our work, we are a coalition dedicated of a variety of professionals ranging from medical providers to those in law enforcement to those in you know political related fields or nonprofits. Um, we all come together to educate and advocate for individuals and groups that might be experiencing human trafficking um, geared towards those that are being affected in Johnson County, but also to really anyone that's being affected. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the coalition, we have a Facebook page, an email, and a website that you can check out. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. So as the title suggests, labor trafficking, a brief overview. I am by no means an expert on labor trafficking, so I will do my best, but um, hopefully after tonight we can all just take away what labor trafficking might look like in our community and around the globe, and then what we can do as um, community members and citizens to help disrupt the cycle of violence that trafficking perpetuates. So who am I and why am I talking about this? So I got my degree in biology and global health and my master's degree in global health at Arizona State University, where my thesis, both in undergrad and graduate school, focused on human trafficking, more specifically the intersection of human trafficking and healthcare, which I predominantly focused on sex trafficking. Um, however, as I kind of moved through my education and research, I realized that I was really lacking in one area, and that happened to be labor trafficking. Um, I recently published an article on labor trafficking and the role of the EMS professional. I've been an EMT for five years, so um, a lot of my research and advocacy focus specifically on educating um, EMS providers. So if you're interested in that, you can feel free to ask me questions about that. And then since moving to Iowa, I have become a proud member of the Johnson County Human Trafficking Coalition. So I don't know about you folks, but I feel like I learn best from stories. I retain the information better, and it sticks with me, and um, I find it easier to recall later on. Um, this is the survivor story of Fainis Lipenga. Fainis was kind enough to let me interview her for that previous article that I just mentioned. Um, she is a survivor of labor trafficking, and this is her story in her own words. I will read it to you. I was brought to the United States to work in the household of a diplomat from my home country, Malawi. I grew up in a poor village without electricity or running water. I suffered abuse since childhood and was in an abusive relationship as a teenager. There was little hope for a better life. So when this family promised me an opportunity in the United States and told me I could get an education while I was there and money to help my family back home, I was so very excited. I was going to break out of poverty and help support others in my village. When we got here, though, nothing was what I had been promised. My employer took away my passport, locked me in the house, and disconnected the phone whenever she left home. I was made to sleep on the basement floor. I was so isolated from the outside world that I had no idea there was help available. I worked all the time, literally all the time. I cared for children and cleaned and did all the manners of the household chores. My employer would allow her friends and colleagues to come over and bring their children, and I was to care for them as well. She yelled at me constantly and was physically abusive. On top of this, she married a man who owned a commercial cleaning business, and I was put to work for him too. In the middle of the night, I was taken to businesses and office buildings to clean carpets using heavy machinery. I worked all night, then was returned to my employer's home to work some more. For all this, I was paid less than 40 cents an hour. I was used, like a piece of clothing you wear, like I was not a person. Everything was a nightmare, like a horror movie, except at a horror movie you can see what's happening. But for me, it was happening behind the door, so no one knew. I became physically sick. I thought I was going to die, here, all alone, and my family would never know. I thought she would just throw my body out, and no one would ever find out what happened to me. Some people ask, then why didn't I leave? Well, there were very real physical concerns. I had no money, no passport, and I didn't know anyone. I did not speak English well but I also know now it is because of what I went through as a child. I did not really fully know that this was not normal, that a person should not be treated this way. I certainly did not know what trafficking was. Finally, though, I knew I had to get out. I think the final push was when I overheard my trafficker bragging about how she had made me sign a contract in English, which I did not know how to read at the time. She told me when I was signing that she was going to pay me $980 a month. She was proud of this trick. I found my passport once when I was cleaning, so I knew I could get to it. 
I slept in the basement and could hear the garage door opening and closing, so I knew when I was alone and when it was safe to leave. I threw a few things I had into a trash bag, grabbed my passport, and left. I went to someone's home who I knew slightly, who was also in the diplomatic community. She helped me find a job with another family, which was good, but I was so worn down that I got very sick. I had to be hospitalized, and I don't know how this happened. My trafficker was actually allowed to come see me in the hospital. Eventually, I got well enough to leave, but I still struggled emotionally, physically, and financially. Physical escape was the only, only one step on the journey to freedom. It took a lot of work and time to find a safe, supportive place to live and get the help I needed. I had a lawyer, and she helped me very much as well. I learned English mostly from watching cartoons and television shows. Today I am working, I am advocating for survivors of human trafficking, and I am studying to become a nurse. I am healing, and I want to help others do the same. So thank you to Fainis for sharing her story. She's a very well-known advocate for labor trafficking survivors. Um, if you want to Google her, um, she does a lot of amazing work with a lot of different organizations. But I really like Fainis' story because I think it kind of highlights a lot of the different tactics that traffickers use um, as it relates to labor trafficking specifically. Okay, so the objectives of today's lecture are to define labor trafficking and its different forms, understand what labor trafficking looks like in our community and around the world, and then become aware of local and national resources for people that are experiencing labor trafficking and then understand what we can do. Um, just as average citizens to help disrupt that cycle of violence. So what is labor trafficking? I always like to include the definition, specifically the legal definition of trafficking when I give presentations, just because if the trafficking case um, does, you know, eventually go to the courts and go through the court system, it's really important that the trafficking case and situation matches the legal definition. Um, so I'm going to read it to you and then kind of highlight the main takeaway that I want you all to grab from it. So the Trafficking Victims Protection Act defines labor trafficking as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt, bondage, or slavery. So the main takeaway here is force, fraud, or coercion. You have to have at least one of those things, force, fraud, or coercion, for the case to be considered human trafficking. That goes for sex trafficking as well. There is one caveat with sex trafficking that we'll get to a little later on, but force, fraud, and coercion are the three really big main takeaways from the definition of trafficking. So you might be thinking to yourself, force, fraud, coercion, what does that look like? So according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, some common examples of force include physical and or sexual abuse, assault, confinement, Examples of fraud include false promises of work living conditions, withholding promised wages, and contract fraud, and then some examples of coercion, threats of harm to self or others, debt bondage, psychological manipulation, and document confiscation. So if we look back to Fainis's story, we can clearly see evidence of force, fraud, and coercion that she experienced during her trafficking situation. So, just some fast facts about um, labor trafficking on the international scale. And when we're talking about human trafficking data and statistics, they are not reliable. Human trafficking is an underreported and underrecognized crime, so it's likely that these numbers are underestimates. But the International Labor Organization, um, every few years, um, releases a report on labor trafficking, and in their 2016 report, they estimated that 16 million people were living in forced labor, a majority of which were women. And then the most common venues for trafficking at that time, internationally we're talking, was domestic work followed by construction, manufacturing, agriculture, and fishing. And then the majority of these labor trafficking victims reported suffering from multiple forms of coercion, such as wages withheld, threats of violence, acting on those threats, and then um, some women, 7%, reported sexual violence. So you might be thinking to yourself, does this happen in my community? Does this happen in Iowa? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. So this screenshot is from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the hotline a little bit later, but for those who aren't familiar, you can go on their website, and they have statistics for their call volumes from each state. So this is the statistic page for the state of Iowa, specifically for the year 2020. So in 2020, they had 285 contacts 
of which 78 um, human trafficking cases were reported. Of those 78 trafficking cases reported, 13 were identified as labor trafficking, and of those 13, the venues reported were domestic work and factories. And then this is something I found um, that the Western Iowa Tech Community College is under investigation for human trafficking because they um, recruited 14 international students from Chile under the guise that they would receive um, an education here in the States. Um, but when they did get here, they were put into debt bondage and forced to um, work in some factories in Iowa. So that case is still going through the court system, but it's definitely happening here in our state. So labor trafficking versus labor exploitation. Um, someone can be exploited for their labor without it being trafficking. Um, so in order to differentiate between labor trafficking and exploitation, we can apply the action means purpose model. So in order for the situation to be considered human trafficking, um, it must meet at least one item from the AMP model. So the action of inducing, recruiting, harbors, transports, provides, or obtains must be present. The means, again, hitting that force, fraud, or coercion, big takeaway from the presentation. And then the purpose either being sex trafficking or labor trafficking. However, there is a caveat to that force, fraud, or coercion. In regards to sex trafficking, um, as soon as a commercial sex act is induced, if you are under the age of 18 years old, you do not have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. You are, it's immediately a sex trafficking case. And then oftentimes we hear human smuggling associated with human trafficking. Um, they are two different crimes. Human smuggling is a crime against a border, where human trafficking is a crime against a person. That's not to say that they can't happen at the same time, but just because one's happening doesn't mean the other is. So signs of labor trafficking. Again, every labor trafficking and just trafficking case in general is very different, looks different. The details might be different, so this is not an exhaustive or comprehensive list of signs to look for, but um, this is just according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline of some things that should be big red flags that something is going on, especially as it relates to labor trafficking. So feel pressured by their employer to stay in a job or situation they want to leave, owe money to an employer or recruiter or not being paid what they were promised or owed, do not have control of their passport or other identity documents, are living and working in isolated conditions, largely cut off from interaction with others or support systems, appear to be monitored by another person when talking or interacting with others, are being threatened by their boss with deportation or other harm, are working in dangerous conditions without proper safety gear, training, adequate breaks, or other protections, are living in dangerous, overcrowded, or inhumane conditions provided by an employer. So again, if we go back to Thanos, we can see how some of these signs were there for um, her case, and then this is a quote by Thanos that I really like. Um, Labor trafficking isn't hard to identify. It's about making a connection, looking someone in the eye, and asking questions. Again, like we all have gut instincts. If something feels off, it, there's a good chance that it might be off. So kind of follow that gut instinct and investigate it further because um, you know all the signs might not be there or even visible to us. So what can we do? So here's our checklist for today's presentation of what we can walk away from today, kind of our action toolkit. So no red flags and signs that might indicate labor trafficking. Check, we just went over that. I think we all feel decent about what force, fraud, and coercion might look like and some common red flags and signs that we can be aware of. Be aware of local and national resources. We are going to head into that discussion as well as learn how to be more of a conscious consumer and then how we can stay, um, how we can advocate politically for this group and then stay educated on human trafficking, which you are all doing by attending this presentation. So moving through our checklist nicely. So some local and national resources. So the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a great organization. You can call or text them anytime. Um, I would throw these numbers in your phone. You never know when you're going to happen across something. I was at the Hobby Lobby on the Coralville Strip on a Friday night, and I saw what to me looks like it could be a sex trafficking situation. So I called the Human Trafficking Hotline. I took down my information and my description, and we're going to look into it. And then also they can point you to other local or national resources. And then also 
kind of if you just have that gut instinct that something might be wrong, they can kind of talk you through it and be like, yeah, you know what, thanks for calling, this might be trafficking, or you know, this looks just like a different kind of situation. So great resource, and then more Iowa specific is the Iowa Victim Service Call Center. You can also call or text them. So just good numbers to have on hand. And then this is one of my favorite ones, um, Be a Conscious Consumer. We vote with our wallets and a lot of different products that we use um, every day. Specifically, I love coffee and chocolate. And unfortunately, um, those are two really big industries that use labor trafficking, especially child labor and exploitation to make those products. So, um, you know, you're not, we're not all gonna go to Hy-Vee tomorrow and get a whole new, you know, pantry, but we can start simple. Um, just be aware of, you know, different products that you might use on a daily basis, like coffee, chocolate, et cetera, that might have um, high instances of using child labor or exploiting other people for labor and might have labor trafficking situations. Um, a great resource for that is the Department of Labor. They have a sweat and toil app where you can go through um, different goods and kind of they have like rankings of which ones are commonly produced with um, like human trafficking or um, labor exploitation and you can kind of dive off and do some further research from there on like what are good brands that are ethical. And then if you want to be horrified, you can do the slavery, go to slavery footprint and it's a calculator. You plug in things about um, like your residence, um, your public transportation or your driving habits and then your dietary and shopping habits and it'll estimate um, how many slaves you likely have working for you. So big wake up call. Um, really great activity. And then for our fashionistas, there's a website called Good On You, which is kind of dedicated to, um, they basically rank brands like from an A to like an F as far as like sustainability and then labor practices. So you can look up your favorite brands and see if, you know, they're doing a good job or a bad job. And then as far as clothing goes, thrifting's a really great way to go. It's also sustainable so um, and then we we live in Iowa so we have lots of farmers markets so kind of that farm to table stuff usually you know where your food is coming from that's not to say that every single person at the farmers market um, is using ethical labor practices it's not to say they aren't I don't know um, but it's I think rewarding to know where your stuff comes from and who's making it and then this is more for the political advocacy. So for those in the room that are familiar with human trafficking advocacy and research, you've likely heard of Polaris. They um, have a great website and they do a lot of great research and advocacy, but they are pushing for visa reform. Polaris has a great page on their website all about um, visa reform and kind of what they're advocating for politicians to do in regards to guest or temporary visas. Because as the video explained, um, the main issue with these temporary visas as it relates to human trafficking is that it ties, the visa ties the individual to a single employer. So they're, that's a really, really vulnerable thing if you're in a country and you really have no other options. So it makes it easier for traffickers to exploit and then harder for people that are being trafficked to report or to leave because like the video said, they, they don't see that they have options. So um, yeah, if you go to Polaris website, they have kind of a call to politicians. And then also Polaris just recently put something on their website um, for human trafficking victims, more, like, more geared towards sex trafficking victims, but to expunge their criminal records for um, crimes that were committed while they were being trafficked. Because you, it's, again, forced fraud or coercion that's typically making these people commit these crimes. So um, you can sign that petition, and then you can also send a letter to your local political representative. So. Um, Polaris is just a good website to, to bookmark and visit from time to time to get updates on the happenings in the human trafficking advocacy world. All right. I kind of flew through that, but does anybody have any questions, concerns, compliments? Yeah. Um, I, I do have compliments. I appreciate, appreciate um, the links and stuff, just the, as someone like, knew the coalition. Yeah. Great resources. And I do have a question. If you noticed, um, or what are things that maybe stop people, just like you mentioned, like observing some suspicious behavior, what are things that stop people from reporting 
I imagine just general ignorance or just not knowing some of those signs, but are there other things that stop people from maybe making that call? I think a lot of it is just like not knowing who to call, um, especially kind of in the climate of our world today. I think more and more people are hesitate to call law enforcement. Um, so that's, I think, something to consider. And then also I think people are like, well, it's, it's not my business. Like, and if they don't see like an active like crime or evidence of something happening, I think it's kind of an uncomfortable position to be in. Like even I did, you know, years of research on sex trafficking and I saw what I thought was a situation in front of me and I still was like, do I call? Like, do I get involved? Um, but I say, you know, it's better to call and just put it out there because, you know, someone might see something similar to you two weeks later and call and you have a documented report of things happening. So I would say it's kind of not knowing who to call, the hesitation to get involved, and then just not even knowing what signs to look for that kind of prevents people from um, reporting potential trafficking situations. Yes. Does this tend to be, well, let me back up. Kudos. That's oh. a great presentation. Thank you. I've a lot uh, of new information. But, um, and the question is, <clears throat> does it tend to be more of like international folks being brought in to do a lot of this labor? Or is there a good instance of people just from different states? Because uh, I know from like LGBTQ perspectives, uh, a lot of kids that become homeless and then yeah. are brought into sex trafficking. So is it like a domestic thing as well, or is it? I wouldn't say, I would say that a majority of the cases that are reported do have some kind of international element to it. But I will say kind of, I would say the key takeaway is that typically for labor trafficking, um, they're trafficked in a community that they're not familiar with. So they're not, they don't have, you know, a network support. They don't know about resources. They might not speak the language, which are all really powerful means to like capitalize on and control. And as we know with all types of human trafficking, there has to be some kind of vulnerability there, typically to for traffickers to capitalize on and exploit. So, um, you know, if you're not from this country, like coming here and not knowing the language and all of these situations and then being threatened with deportation, those are all really big vulnerabilities that they can, traffickers can capitalize on as a means of exploitation. All right, great questions. Um, thank you all for coming, especially for labor trafficking. I know sex trafficking gets a lot of the attention, um, especially you know in the media and documentaries, they're a lot more focused, sex trafficking focused. Um, but I think it's important for all of us in this realm, whether we're just concerned citizens or affiliated with different nonprofits, or even if our professions, like if you work in the restaurant industry or hotel industry, healthcare, really any industry, um, this could be happening, and so it's important to be educated. So tell your friends, do your slavery footprint, be horrified, try to make a change. Um, I always like to tell my friends around Halloween, they'll like be going to eat like a Nestle Crunch bar, and I'm like, you sure you want to eat that? Kind of ruins chocolate for people, but yeah, just got to start somewhere. So thank you all for coming. Um, we, not we, well, yes, the Johnson County Human Trafficking Coalition, as well as a few other organizations are getting together to um, put on an event at the Englert December 15th um, related to the USA Gymnastics um, Larry Nasser trial, the judge who proceeded over that trial. She will be there. Um, there'll be a documentary showing and then a panel where you can ask the judge and other experts questions. So these are my references. And thank you all for coming.